welcome to the welcome to this evening uh, main event or only event. And uh, so this will be uh, this is part, as you know, of the American Mathematical Society meeting uh, of the Western Section that's taking care of uh, that's taking place on campus this weekend. And uh, it's also part of um, the Bay Area Science Festival. And uh, it's co-sponsored by the American Math Society, the Bay Area Science Festival, and the uh, uh, Mathematical Science Research Institute in Berkeley. And I'm just going to introduce uh, the introducer. I'm, the <laughs> <laughs> I'm Michelle Lapidus, the uh, AMS Associate Secretary in charge of this meeting. And our introducer tonight is uh, David Eisenberg, who is a former president of the American Mathematical Society and current director of the MSRI, the Mathematical Science Research Institute in Berkeley. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Jim Simons, a dear and now old friend. Uh, he's going to talk about luck, and I want to talk about luck too, and I'll start with a sort of personal story. My father, Leonard Eisenbud, was a physicist and joined the physics department at Stony Brook in 1957, just one year after it started. Stony Brook is a great place now, but it had growing pains. And at one point, the math department was in such terrible shape that the provost felt he needed to have a committee of outsiders to find a new chair and that no one in the department would do. So they went searching for an outside chair. Various people applied. And my father was on the committee that uh, was to make the choice. And they made some pretty questionable choices, among them this inexperienced young guy, Jim Simons, who'd never <laughs> done any administration before and really was too young for the job. Uh, and they interviewed the candidates. And uh, the provost, when he interviewed Jim, according to Jim, said, you know, of all the people I've interviewed, you're the only one who actually seems to want the job. <laughs> <laughs> And indeed, nobody else took the job, and Jim did. Talk about luck for Stony Brook. I feel I've been touched by that luck, too, in getting to know Jim. PhD from Berkeley in 1958 with Bertram Coston, whom I saw in the audience a moment ago. Uh, where, is, where is Bertram Coston? Somewhere around, unless he left again. Uh, 61. 61. Oh. Your, your Wikipedia entry is <laughs> questionable. <laughs> he was the winner of the AMS Veblen Prize in 1976. Is that the right date? Uh, <laughs> he discovered that minimal manifolds can have singularities, starting in dimension 7. Not such an obvious construction. Now very famous for Chern-Simons theory, which is applied in math and physics in all kinds of unexpected ways. In 1982, a change of life, he founded Renaissance Technologies. And in some sense, the amazing chapter, really even more amazing chapter started then. He did nothing but use math and a lot of talented people's work too uh, to become one of the richest men on earth and has now been sharing his wealth and his luck with the rest of us who are here. And now we'll all share the luck again in listening to Jim himself. Jim. is a high thing. Okay, I guess you can hear me. Thank you very much for uh, such a nice introduction. So I'm going to uh, kind of talk about uh, my life and its various paraginations. Uh, some of it about math and some of it about common sense and some of it about good luck. And uh, then uh, I'll take some questions uh, if, there are, if there are any. So, uh, so I, I, I always liked math uh, when I was a little kid. Uh, I didn't think of it as math, just numbers and, and having fun. I, uh, but I discovered Zeno's, so this is proof of my thoughtfulness as a child. I discovered Zeno's paradox at about four years old, not knowing it was anybody's paradox or not knowing what the word paradox meant. But I learned from my father, to my horror, that a car could run out of gasoline. 
And I said, well, shouldn't run out. You could use half of what you have, and then you could use half of that, and then you could use half of that, and you'll never run out. And uh, <laughs> I didn't, it didn't occur to me that you'd never get anywhere either. But on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, so uh, my family doctor, Dr. Kaplan, uh, he knew I was a bright boy, and he said, well, you know, uh, a bright Jewish boy, you should be a doctor. You know, that's a, great, that's a great field, and I wanted nothing less than to be a doctor. And I said, well, I don't really want to be a doctor. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to do something like with engineering or math or something. I didn't know much. I was about eight years old. And he said, well, you know, uh, you can't make any money doing that stuff. And I said... <laughs> And I, you know, uh, it didn't. It didn't seem to be very much of an impediment. At eight years old, I wasn't thinking about making a lot of money. I was just thinking that I did not want to be a doctor, <laughs> which was a, a very good choice for me. And it turns out for anyone who would have had the unfortunateness to be my patient, because I would not have done a very good job. Uh, I, but I did like working, and uh, my first job was as a stock boy in Breck 's garden supply during the Christmas season. They hired kids a uh, few people, and I got this job. Uh, a stock boy works down in the basement in this particular place, uh, looking you know bringing stuff up to the floor and putting stuff away. But I was not a good stock boy because I could never remember where anything went. There seemed to be no rhyme or reason, no order. It wasn't alphabetized or anything like that. You just had to know where things were. So the two people who ran it down there realized I was a failure as a stock boy. But I was there, so they said, okay, you can sweep the floor. And I loved that job. So then I had a big push broom and sawdust, and I could throw the sawdust on the floor and push the broom and walk up and down, keeping the floors clean and thinking, which I enjoyed to do, enjoyed doing very much. And it, and it came to the end, and Christmas was passed, and there was time for me to leave. So this couple sat me down and said goodbye and so on and asked me what I was going to do. I was, I think, 14. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to study mathematics. I'm, I think I want to go to MIT. Well, they laughed very, very hard, and they, and I'm sure they were thinking, this kid who doesn't even know where the dried sheep manure is uh, is, is going to go to MIT and study mathematics. Well, I, I did. I never got back to them and said, see, I did that, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I did, and uh, I went to MIT and, and uh, did study mathematics, and uh, uh, realized that there, you know, one could be a mathematician. I, but I really had an epiphany um, when I learned Stokes' theorem. Now, I guess you're all mathematicians, so you probably know Stokes' theorem. You integrate one thing over a boundary, and you take its differential, and you, that's the same as integrating that over the interior of something. And that, you know, it's a great generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus, and it works in all dimensions. And I thought it was the most beautiful thing that theorem, and and, uh, and it, it really made me uh, appreciate mathematics. It made me want to become go into this field of differential geometry, which I had sort of gradually learned existed. And a, a uh, what sealed the deal was a delicatessen called Jack and Marion's in Boston. Uh, it's not there anymore, I'm afraid, but it was uh, quite a place, and it was open very late at night, and as uh, an undergraduate, we used to go there and hang out and eat, maybe at 2 in the morning, because young, young kids can eat at all hours, as some of you perhaps remember. And, but frequently, uh, is Singer and Warren Ambrose, uh, I guess everyone's heard of Singer, Ambrose was an older fellow, he must have been 50, he seemed ancient to me, although he was a great uh, teacher. They would show up there and uh, work. And uh, they go over to some booth and drink coffee and uh, do mathematics. And I thought, my God, you know, what a great life. You know, here are these grown-ups, you know, and, and they're, they're doing this stuff. Uh, they, they wouldn't dress in suits. They just had, you know, regular outdoor clothes. And uh, I said, what, what a life this is. It's 2 in the morning. 
over sandwiches talking about math. So it was clear that that was the, that was for me. Uh, <laughs> I graduated uh, MIT. I, I graduated early, but I stayed one more year of graduate school. But when I graduated, which was in 1958, see, that's where the 58 came from. Where was David? He confused those dates, 58. I did something that was actually um, an example of uh, having no common sense at all, but it turned out that there was some good luck involved. I, in those days, motor scooters had just been becoming popular, you know, Vespas, and uh, they were Italian. It was either a Vespa or a Lambretta. Those were the two choices you had. And uh, we decided, I and a friend from Columbia, uh, South America, an MIT friend, uh, who was not a mathematician, we decided to ride our motor scooters, we get motor scooters, we didn't have them, we didn't even know how to, how to ride motor scooters, but we felt it, felt it couldn't be that difficult. We're going to ride them from Boston to Buenos Aires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Boston, they both began with B, you know, uh, Boston to Buenos Aires, and we got the motor scooters, and a third guy joined the gang, and we we did get halfway. We got to Bogota, and that took seven weeks, and uh, uh, I at least almost died. Uh, I came extremely close to death. Uh, I think I never told my mother that. Uh, if my mother had had the slightest idea of uh, how dangerous that trip was, she wouldn't let me go, but for some reason she, she did. And... Uh, so I got there. Now, one of the themes of this talk is how important partners are and people that you work with. And so this fellow, this Colombian boy, and, and his friend uh, subsequently became my first partners in a business venture, which I'll, which I'll get to in a minute. But, uh, so it was, uh, it was lucky on that account, but it sh showed little signs of common sense. A anyway... I spent one year at MIT as a graduate student. They thought I'd been at MIT long enough and that I should go to Berkeley and meet Chern, the great geometer of the day, and uh, get a, a proper education in differential geometry since that's what I seemed to like. So I went there, and uh, I got a nice fellowship. I went to Berkeley. Uh, the only thing is that uh, Chern did not go to Berkeley. That, uh, Chern was coming to Berkeley that year. That's why... They said I should go there too, but Chern, perhaps knowing I was coming, decided <laughs> decided to go somewhere else for that year. I guess he was on sabbatical or something, so I didn't uh, I didn't see Chern, uh, but I worked with uh, Costin. Someone told me Bert Costin was here. Is he here? No, he's not here. Uh, I think maybe you didn't really see him. Um, but anyway, I worked with a fellow named Bert Costin. But the first thing that I did when I got to Berkeley, or very early, was, uh, well, I, I got married, actually. I got married uh, within a month of uh, getting there, and there was a wedding, and we even got wedding presents, and so, uh, which were cash. So I had, or we had, uh, some money. And I thought, well, it's just lying there. We should invest it. I didn't know anything at all about investing, but I knew that one could invest money. So I went to Merrill Lynch, and I was, you know, now I was uh, 21 years old, and said I wanted to open an account, and uh, there were two stocks that I thought would be just terrific, and I wanted to buy these stocks. Well, I said, okay, and I bought the stocks, and... But I'm an impatient guy, and after a month, nothing happened. They didn't go down. They didn't go up. They didn't go anywhere. So I was bored with that uh, uh, thing. So I went back and said, uh, well, uh, isn't there something that's a little more lively and that I could, you know, uh, <laughs> you have any ideas? Go, oh, yeah. He said, the soybeans. You should buy soybeans. And I, I had heard of soybeans. Uh, I'd, <laughs> I'd never eaten one myself. It turns out perhaps most people haven't ever eaten a soybean, but uh, pigs eat them in great quantities, uh, and cows and so on. But uh, I said, well, what does that mean exactly? He said, well, you, you, know, you buy 5,000 bushels. That's a contract. It's a futures market. Uh, our guys tell us soybeans are going through the roof. You'll make a lot of money. 
I said, okay. So I bought two contracts of soybeans, and they did. They went up. I was making money. They went down. I was losing money. I uh, sold sold them both. I got nervous. Then I bought one contract. Meanwhile, I was going back and forth from Berkeley into San Francisco early in the morning to watch the soybean market. And, uh, you know, I early it was, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning already I was out. I mean, that was very early for a graduate student. And and after a couple of weeks, I came to the most sensible conclusion uh, of my life, I think. I said, I'm either going to write a thesis or trade soybeans, because you couldn't possibly do both. <laughs> and and uh, I came to that realization at a good point. I had a very small profit. I said, OK, I'm closing out the profit. And uh, it was years before I ever traded a soybean again, although the occasion did arise. So then I went and worked on it. I mean, you couldn't do both. You couldn't write a thesis and, and trade soybeans. Anyway, I couldn't. Uh, so, uh, so I did write a thesis, and it was a very gratifying experience. Uh, I wrote it. I'm sorry Bert's not here. But uh, so I, I got some results, which I showed to my professor, and he said, oh, those are very interesting. That's nice. Uh, you know, it suggests that uh, a question that's open about holonomy groups. Anyone know what a holonomy group is? Probably a lot of you know it. Anyway, okay. This, yes? Okay. Some of you know. Anyway, it, it's a group that's associated to a connection on a, uh, on a manifold, let's say on the tangent bundle. You can parallel translate all around and come back to where you started, and you move the tangent space. And it was, had just been shown all the possible, and that's a Lie group. It's a, it's a linear trans, group of linear transformations. And, and it had recently been shown that there was a list of all the possible candidates for holonomy groups on an irreducible manifold, one you couldn't write as a product of two other Riemannian manifolds. And that list happened to include only groups that were transitive on the unit sphere. So every one of those groups you would take any point on the sphere in the tangent space and bring it to any other point. So it, would, it, would, uh, it was transitive. So. And uh, so that was kind of a question, well, why are they all transitive on, on the sphere? And I said, oh, I, I, I want to try that problem. And it, he said, don't do that. He said, that's a very hard problem. Uh, you know, so Burrell tried it. He couldn't figure out it. So that was just like throwing gasoline on the fire. <laughs> you know, I said, well, I'm going to do that problem. And by a, uh, well, perhaps a miracle, I did. So uh, that was a good thesis. I was very pleased. Uh, I'd had some interactions with Singer along the way because he was interested in that problem. And uh, we talked about it a little bit or wrote to each other. And so then they... They uh, I finished that, and they hired me, and I went to MIT and became uh, a more instructor. But, okay, so now I was an instructor at MIT, but I still had this sort of, I don't know, urge to do something different. And when I had been in Colombia on my motor scooter trip, and we got to Bogota, and I saw Colombia and my friends, it was a very exciting country. You, you could do anything there, it seemed. Uh, there were all kinds of things that could be manufactured in one thing or another. And I had this friend down there who was very smart, in fact, two friends. And I said, you know, you guys ought to start a business. And they said, well, I don't know. I said, okay, I'm going to come down to Columbia, and I won't leave until we find a business. And uh, not that I had any money particularly to invest in this business, so it turned out I did have a little bit. And I stayed there two weeks. We found a business. Uh, they said they were gonna they were gonna do it. The father of one of them put up half the money. I said, okay, I, I'll scrape. And my father and I put up a little bit of money. And uh, then I went back to to uh, MIT after those two weeks. And uh, of course, it took a little while for all that to manif take place. But I decided after that first year. You know, this is so exciting. I'm, I'm going to move to Columbia and work in this factory, in this place. It was another nutty idea. And uh, so I took a job in the interim because the place wasn't ready. In fact, wouldn't have been ready for another 
two years or a year and a half uh, in an engineering place while some engineering company. So I quit the more instructorship, and I my job was to computers were just coming in. My job was to calculate Bessel functions on a computer. Now, I didn't know what a Bessel function was at that time, although I certainly learned what it was. And they made antennas, and they needed. Anyway, it was the most tedious, horrible thing one could do was just calculate Bessel functions all day long. So uh, I began to really miss academia. I, w I was friends with Bott and with Singer and these guys. And so I, I said to Singer, you know, I think I made a mistake. I, and he said, oh, well, we'll put you on Bott's contract. Bott was a great mathematician at Harvard. In those days, you had an NSF contract. They were very loose. You could just hire someone on the contract. So I went on Bott's contract. And, uh, uh, and, and then I went back and said, OK, I, I'll let those boys run the factory. And I'll, I'll, I'll just be a minority investor, and uh, I'll work on mathematics, which I did. And I was working on, as David mentioned, uh, minimal, minimal varieties. And minimal varieties are manifolds that are, have minimal area or volume, depending on the dimension, with respect to their boundary. So uh, a soap bubble is a minimal variety in two dimensions, uh, typically. Not a soap bubble, but if you take a f wire frame and dip it in soap, you'll get a film. That's going to minimize area. And uh, so I was just studying that subject kind of from first principles. Almost all the work had been very, uh, had been analysis. But I was trying to understand the, the geometry of, of, of these things and, and was working slowly and going along. Uh, and they hired me at Harvard to, to be uh, assistant professor. So I was at Harvard for a full two years, once on Bott's contract and once on assistant professor. But I actually didn't like Harvard. I don't know, there was something. Any Harvard men or women here today? Probably. Yes, there is some. Well, maybe with you there, I'd have liked it better. But <laughs> and I don't even know you. But, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It was a stodgy place. Uh, and, uh, and also, the, the, they started the factory, so I, I felt I needed a change. So I went. Uh, there's a place in Princeton that's still going strong. Uh, called the Institute for Defense Analyses, or it's a branch of the Institute for Defense Analyses. And there they would hire mathematicians, and there it was super secret. It was a very highly classified place. They worked on secret codes and ciphers. In fact, in those days, you weren't even allowed to say what they worked on. So it was just stuff. But now it's permissible to say that's what they worked on. And it was, it was I didn't know anything about codes and ciphers, but I knew they paid a lot. And you could spend half your time doing mathematics. And ha uh, as much as happy, and the other half you had to work on their stuff, and that sounded pretty good. So we moved to Princeton, and uh, well, I loved that job. I I I loved everything about it. I I learned about computers. I learned first that I do not a would never know how to program a computer uh, with any skill whatsoever, but there were fortunately people who could. I learned I like to make algorithms and think about uh, testing things out on a computer. Uh, maybe you can crack this code with this algorithm. Most of the time it didn't work. Sometimes it did. It was kind of exciting. And I liked the people. And I uh, was still working away at minimal varieties. And uh, <coughs> after maybe two or two years there, maybe into my third year, uh, I solved this uh, the, the, the sort of famous problem in the subject of minimal varieties, which uh, and as David uh, said, uh, I showed that uh, you could uh, fill in smoothly. This is in co-dimension one in Euclidean space. So in Euclidean space, you have a, a, a boundary of one dimension lower, and you want a, a f uh, two dimensions lower, like a curve in three space, whatever. And you want to fill in. And I, I proved that you could do that smoothly without, without you know, any... Uh, uh, singularities, uh, through ambient dimension 7. So up to six-dimensional surfaces and seven-dimensional uh, space with a five-dimensional boundary, I guess. Uh, it would work. You could do it, a uniform proof. But in one dimension more, my proof broke down, and I suggested a counterexample, uh, which turned out to, uh, and I couldn't prove it was a, 
I uh, couldn't prove it was a counterexample. It was locally stable, but it might not have been globally stable. Now, so it's a beautiful thing. You take the three-sphere and you cross it with itself. So now you get a, a six-dimensional thing sitting in, uh, in the actual the seven-dimensional sphere in eight space. Anyway, that's the boundary, six-dimensional boundary. The cone on that, which obviously since it's a cone, clearly has a vertex and a singularity, but that does minimize uh, uh, volume, six to seven, uh, seven dimensional uh, volume. And, uh, and then, so, uh, so that was a, a good uh, result and published this paper, which was everything I knew about minimal varieties was packed into this paper, but it was a, it was a good paper. And so that was uh, very nice. And, uh, David said I won the Bevelin Prize, and that's, I guess, what I, what I wanted for some few years later. And I was also doing good work for, for them. It was, uh, it was great, but it was the Vietnam War time. You remember, you all know about the Vietnam War, and some of you uh, probably lived through it. And uh, so, now, we didn't do any work that had anything to do with the Vietnam War, as far as I knew, although, in fact, God knows what they did with what we did, because I never read any of the secret messages, because we didn't have access to that stuff. We just tried to crack the codes. But, uh, but I didn't like the war. Now, so the boss of my boss was in Washington, D.C. He was a general named Maxwell Taylor. Some of you probably remember old Maxwell Taylor. And he was, uh, had been a general. Now he'd been kicked upstairs. He ran the Institute for Defense Analyses. And he wrote an article for the New York Times. It was a cover story in the magazine section, the Sunday paper, how we're doing so great in Vietnam. We're going to win the war. It's very important. Just, let's just hold still. It's a terrific enterprise. Well, I mean, I didn't think so. And, uh, and I'm sure there were others who didn't think so. But I wrote a letter to the Times saying not everyone who works for General Taylor shares his views. In fact, I think the whole thing is stupid. And... Uh, <laughs> I mean, the words were classier than that, but uh, <laughs> but that was the effect of the letter. And they published that letter uh, eagerly, I'm sure, uh, because, you know, uh, no one said anything. I didn't hear anything from my superiors. Uh, I heard plenty from my friends, but uh, so I, okay, you know. But then, a few months later, a, a, a young guy came, uh, sought me out. He told me he was a reporter for Newsweek magazine. I think it still exists, but in these those days, it was the one of the two big news weeklies, that and Time magazine. He's doing a story in Newsweek magazine on people who work for the Defense Department who are opposed to the war. And he said, I don't have many takers. Cause, uh, <laughs> but... But I wonder if you would, uh, I could interview you. Now, I was 29 years old. No one had ever asked me for an interview before. Uh, and I thought, oh, sure, of course you can interview me. So, <laughs> so he interviewed me. And, uh, you know, so uh, the bottom line was I said, well, the rule at uh, IDA is you have to spend uh, half your time at their stuff and you can spend half your time at your own stuff. And my algorithm now is but I'm spending all my time on mathematics and when the war is over I'll spend an equal amount of all my time at their stuff so I'll make it all up and say that's that's what I'm doing that's what I'm doing yeah exactly oh ho 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 because uh, it, and it wasn't even quite true but it was close to being true anyway then I did the only intelligent thing I had done that day I uh, I told my boss that I gave his interview it would have been more intelligent if I told him before I gave the interview, but I didn't. I told him afterwards. He says, you did? He said, well, well, what did you say? I said, well, I told him about my half-and-half half proposition. And so he says, oh, he says, I, got, I have to call Taylor, his boss. So he called Taylor. My memory is a little faint on this point, but I think he may have called him in my presence, or maybe I had to leave the room. But it seemed like only a microsecond before he told me, you're fired. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, you know, my title is permanent member of the, 
as a permanent member of this outfit. I, how can you find? He said, well, it used to be a temporary member. He said, I'll tell you the difference between a temporary member and a permanent member. He said, a temporary member has a contract. And a permanent member doesn't. So uh, I didn't have a leg to stand on. Uh, they may have given me a, a week severance. I don't remember what the deal was. But they were probably more generous than that. Anyway, there I was. I didn't have a job. I had uh, a wife, three kids, uh, and no job. But I wasn't, you know, I had proved this theorem. I knew I could get an academic job. And so I wasn't, uh, you know, terrified at the prospect. It was all kind of exhilarating, actually, being fired. Uh, I, I think it's good once. I, you shouldn't make a habit of it. You, should, <laughs> you shouldn't make a habit of being fired, but once is perhaps salutary. Anyway, uh, I did get, as David said, this offer at, at Stony Brook to be chair, and I thought that would, that would really be fun. As I've said before, I thought it would be better to be the fire roar than the fiery. <laughs> 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 and uh, the, the department was not strong. They had a great physics department at that time. It was a very new university, and uh, I had a wonderful time. Uh, building a department, and, and uh, I met uh, Frank Yang, the famous physicist who was, who was there, and we, be, we became friends, and uh, uh, we had an interesting interaction. So he would, uh, after a few months, he invited me up to his office. He was going to tell me what he was doing. Uh, I didn't know any physics, but he was, you know, Nobel Prize winning great man, and I figured I'd go up and get a lecture. And so I sat down, and he told me what he was doing. He covered the board with equations. Well, I didn't understand a goddamn thing. I didn't understand anything. I didn't know any physics. But, you know, I looked, and I looked, tried to look as intelligent as possible. Uh, I thanked him very much at the end, and I went back downstairs. And we repeated the same thing in year two, and then again in year three. But something happened in the middle of the lecture of year three. I, he he kind of showed me these same equations. They were getting familiar. And then I realized, I said, stop, stop right there. He said, why should I stop? He said, because you're trying to invent mathematics that was done 30 or 40 years ago. He said, what? You know, what he was doing was, uh, in, in gauge theory, you, you use bundles and they have connections. But I think he didn't know that you could also have there was such a thing as parallel transport and, and a holonomy group and all that stuff. And he was torturously trying to uh, create parallel translation uh, in, a, in a, a, a bundle with a connection. And I said, you know, the mathematicians have done that. And he said, why would they have ever done that? Why would, they, why would they study that kind of stuff? And I said, well, it was beautiful and natural and it just came out. Anyway, how could I answer that question except to say it just came out of mathematics? So uh, that was a... A great moment uh, because he said, okay, so we had a seminar. He organized a seminar of the members of this Institute for Theoretical Physics, and it was kind of a translation seminar. I said, we say this, you say that kind of thing. And, and uh, he even wrote a glossary. He even wrote some kind of book with all these, these things. But it was, uh, it, was, it was the smartest group of students I ever had. It was the, his whole faculty, so it was, uh, <laughs> you know, I had a... Uh, but uh, it was great, and they gave me at the end a very thick dictionary because I'm a terrible speller. They gave me one of these things that weighs a hundred pounds, you know, and uh, uh, as a, as a gift, as a gift for that. So in the meantime, I was doing geometry myself, and I started working with uh, Churn, the, the 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 guy. We had become friends. He came in the second year, and uh, when I was at Berkeley, having missed the first year, but we became friends. Uh, we didn't do any any science together, but we became friends. And uh, and I had, while at Stony Brook, come up with some uh, some geometry in, in three dimensions that looked quite interesting. Uh, I showed it to him, and he said, "Oh, well, we can do this in all dimensions. This is very exciting, and so on." So we we worked together, and uh, developed and wrote a paper, and that was the roots of these uh, Chern Simons invariants, which. Uh, have seemed to uh, uh, be used in, in a lot of places, which is, you know, an example. I mean, here we did this math, and we didn't think, oh, it's going to apply to 
this, that, or the other thing. I we thought maybe it'll apply, you know, maybe other mathematics. We built on it, as I suppose it was. But uh, the idea that it would find its way into physics 10 years later and, and become quite ubiquitous. I mean, it's in uh, condensed matter physics. It's in high energy physics. It's in cosmology. Uh, Chern Simon's term. And, and, you know, I don't know what they're doing with it. I don't have the faintest idea. But... Uh, Mathematics is that way, and basic science is that way. You do a piece of basic science, you know, uh, and you don't know where it's going to go. But if it's pretty good science, it, it uh, can lead to uh, surprising, surprising places. I mean, I, when Maxwell developed the Maxwell equations, did television occur to him as a, <laughs> as a consequence? I don't think so. You know, he just wanted to know how the hell do these, how does this work? And uh, obviously he figured it out. So I was doing mathematics with Chern and then with a guy named Jeff Cheeger. Uh, I grew out of that uh, with uh, something called differential characters, which now is kind of the root of a subject called differential cohomology, if you've ever heard of that. And w we, got, we worked on that, and it led to questions that neither of us could figure out uh, about uh, uh, rational numbers or... or certain volumes, were they rational or irrational? We really wanted to figure it out, and we couldn't. We spent a couple of years uh, struggling with those questions. I won't take away they, where they came from. But in the meantime, my investment in Columbia paid off. So part of the company was sold. I had a few bucks. My father had more, but we, 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 we had some money. and. My Colombian friends, God knows why, said, okay, we have this money. We want you to invest it for us. Now, where they got the idea that I would be any better at investing for them uh, than that broker at Merrill Lynch years ago, I don't know. But I said, fine, I'll do that. And, and I had a friend who had been a mathematician and was now a commodity trader. And he seemed to be doing pretty well. So I said, Charlie, we have this money. Would you manage it for us? And he said, yeah, of course. I'll be happy to, he said. Uh, why not? It was more than he'd ever seen. So uh, he thought it was good. And so I made a deal with Charlie. He was going to get 25% of the profits. No fixed fee, but 25% of the profits. And I said, but if we lose much money, and I said, uh, you know, if we lose 25%, you have to stop. You have to, we don't want to lose all the money. So that's a stop loss, okay? But as I was walking out of his apartment, something occurred to me, and I said, oh, also, if you make too much, we're going to have to stop. And he said, well, how much is too much? It's a reasonable question. I said, 10 times what we invested after your rapacious fee. Well, how could he say no? I mean, 10 times as much. So he said, fine. So that was the, the other stopping rule. We stopped on that basis after 10 months. He had actually, he had multiplied the money by a factor, I guess, of 13, and when you take off 20. Anyway, we actually made 10 times our money. It was incredible. It was just completely lucky. Uh, he, well, I, I won't. I know it was completely lucky. <laughs> but there it was. So uh, now I really, you know, had, had some money. And I had followed his work. I had followed his work carefully. In fact, he never, I had to, because he never quite knew where he was. Uh, so uh, I said, okay, I'll keep the books I, I, every week. I'll tell you where you stand. He said, okay, that's great. It'll take that, my mind off that. So I did that. And uh, so I learned a little bit about that. And then it was the soybeans in my youth. And uh, I thought, okay, uh, mathematics is driving me crazy. I, uh, I was, uh, had j j recently gotten divorced. I was on the wrong side of the first wife. I was involved with another woman uh, who... It turned out to be my second wife and my present wife, and uh, I was frustrated with the work, so I thought, I'm going to go into business and be uh, a trader, 
and uh, and I did, I did do that, and uh, I brought, uh, I started doing some trading, and that was working okay. I got some investors. I brought in a guy from IDA. He was the best crypto analyst in the world. He was a he was a wonderful model maker, and, and so on. He, in fact, he. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Baum-Welsh algorithm or the EM algorithm. Anyway, it's a famous algorithm in statistics. He was uh, the Baum of Baum-Welsh, Baum -Welsh. so he was a very smart guy. And I said, you know, you, I'm looking at these commodity charts. Actually, it was currencies that we were trading, and they seem to have some shape to them. They don't look random to me, so maybe we could make some models. And he said, okay. But it turned out, and we did. We made a model, and it looked like it was going to be okay and to, to trade, but we were doing fundamental trading. And he, he hated the model building. He said, I, you know, I, but he loved the fundamental trading. He loved reading the newspapers and reading the tickers and, and, and uh, the news tickers and getting ideas. And it turned out he was, for a while, uh, very, very good. So we put the models aside for a while, and uh, we traded. Uh, and we, we we did very well. We did very well, but it was a gut wrenching experience. You know, it's you know one day you walk in and you think you're a genius. God, all my positions are in my way. Look, I'm a, and the next day you walk in and they're against you, and you feel like you're a, you're a dope. How could I have done what I did and so on? There was no rhyme or reason. It was just you know you put your finger in the air and you try to sense which way the the wind is blowing. I'll tell you one story to uh, illustrate. The craziness. So it was a time when gold was going up. Uh, gold had be had been. Uh, you couldn't buy or sell gold, and finally you could. And it was it, the price was rising, and it was rising. And we had a a deal where uh, Lenny Lenny Baum and I, where we'd each have the same. We'd each have our own account. I was the boss, but we each had our own account. And in our own account, in fact, we both bought gold. We're supposed to be independent, but we both like gold. The gold was going up. It, was, it started at 200 and 300 and 400 $500. It got to $500, which by today's standards would be like $1,500 or $1,800. Uh, and I said, you know, this is, this is a very high price. I, I, I'm getting out. I, I, and I sold my half. But Lenny, I think you should. No, he was. You don't know how high this is going to go. You can't. This is going to. This is uh, going to go very, very high. I said, okay. So he stayed. It was six hundred. It was seven hundred. It was eight hundred. Got to eight hundred dollars. That day, I happened to be talking to a friend of mine on the phone who was a stockbroker, and he, in fact, he was my stockbroker. And uh, I said, how are things, Dick? And he said, oh well, they're fine. This morning. My wife, Lucy, uh, came into my closet and cleaned out all of my uh, uh, old tie clasps and cufflinks and went downtown to sell them. They were gold. They were gold, see? I said, well, are you having a hard time in your family? Why is she, so your wife said, oh, he says, you know, she's a jeweler. I said, yes, I know that. So he said, so she only has to stand in the short line. I said, what do you mean, the short line? He says, don't you know that people are lining up and standing for hours selling their gold? I said, no, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. <laughs> we had a phone in those days. If you picked it up, it was a different phone. If you picked it up, you went right to the floor of the commodity exchange. And I got Lenny in the office, and I put the phone up to his ear, and I said, Lenny, sell the gold. In fact, I, and he said, no, 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 no. I said, Lenny, I'm the boss. Sell the blankety blank gold. I was uh, more emphatic uh, than that. He said, All right, all right. So he sold the gold. And maybe it was $810. Oh, but he was mad. And the next day, we came in and it opened at $830. And oh, he said, I, showed, I told you. By the end of that day, it had dropped 25%. It was down to $600 all in one day, and it never, of course, went back up. So that is an example of common sense and very good luck. The good luck, if, if I hadn't called my stockbroker the day I did, 
uh, Lenny would have held on to that goal. It, would have gone, it went back to 200 after a while. We would have wrote it all, written it all the way down, I think. And uh, so it was just plain luck that I had. But it was at least common sense that I thought if everyone in the world is trying to sell that gold, how long can it be going up? You know, it's, uh, there is such a thing as supply and demand. So uh, there it was. So that was what it was like to be a fundamental trader. It was uh, stomach wrenching. So Jim Axe, I got Jim Axe, who was a very well known algebraist, uh, to come and work for us. And he was interested in the models that Lenny eschewed. And he got a good computer programmer, and we built some models. And, and he showed that the models would use for currencies, would work for all commodities. And we were on our way with models. And uh, well, we uh, kept fundamental trading, but more and more we were trading the models. And finally, it took about eight years. Uh, the models were good enough, and we went to all models. And then we started the company. This was a forerunner. And we started the company called Renaissance Technologies, which uh, has been going ever since. And uh, it has. Uh, 300 people, it has uh, 90 PhDs, and uh, it's 100 percent, it's 100 percent model. And, and it's, it's been uh, remarkably uh, uh, profitable uh, for a long time. And other mathematicians came in to help. I don't know if Elwin Burlakamp is here, maybe some of you know Elwin. Uh, Henry Laufer joined us, and they each made important, uh, important contributions. So it has been remarkably successful. So people say, well, what, what's the secret? And, and, well, there are a lot of little secrets because the way this works, you have a lot of uh, smart guys and they keep inching away and getting a new idea here and a new idea there and you pile them together and soon you have an awful lot of little ideas that are independent of each other and uh, you can, you know, you can uh, make, some, make some progress. But the, I think, so people say, what's the secret sauce? But the secret sauce was really, in the first instance, having very smart people working for the firm. We, we were academics ourselves. We had an idea of who was a good scientist and who wasn't. And we brought in and continued to bring in excellent people, not just mathematicians, but uh, computer scientists, statisticians, uh, experimental physicists, uh, uh, astronomers. We got four or five astronomers who are good. They, they look at data. They, they can't do experiments. They have to, you can't make this star bump into that star. You just have to, <laughs> you have to take it as it is and that's, you know, and, and uh, make models. So, uh, great scientists. We built a terrific infrastructure. The computer guys are wonderful. Uh, so we take in, uh, I think it takes in uh, nine, nine terabytes a day of data comes into that outfit. And it all gets stored and organized and, and, and dished up to the researchers and so on. So it's a great infrastructure. It's an open atmosphere. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And every, every week there's a research meeting. If you've had a good idea that you, you think it's going to go somewhere, you present it. If it looks good, it's, it goes to a small meeting. People vet it more carefully. But there aren't little groups uh, working in the dark. Oh, this is my little system, and I want you to use it. So, and that's the best way to do science, I think, uh, in, a, in a collaborative manner. Sure, you don't immediately, the first time you, get, you have a thought, you don't run down the hallway saying, I have a thought. But, uh, you know, you test it out a little bit. But, uh, so I think that's, th that's a very good way to do things. Everybody has a piece of the profits. Uh, all the senior people own part of the business, and that, I think, is good, too. So we have very little turnover. And, uh, and we trade everything world, world, worldwide. Uh, we trade everything. It runs 24 hours a day, not seven days a week, but I guess five. And the, the only rule is we never override the computer. No one ever comes in any day and says, the computer wants to do this, that's crazy, we shouldn't do it. it you don't do it because you can't, you can't simulate that. You can't study the past and wonder whether the boss was going to come in and change, change his mind about something. So you just stick with it and it's, and it's, uh, and it's worked. So, well, uh, so obviously uh, I, I made money 
and uh, in 1974 with my wife Marilyn, uh, we started a foundation, uh, charitable. We'd been giving money away, and Marilyn thought, hey, we should have a foundation, so we had a foundation. And it was a one-woman foundation. It was in a, her dressing room, and she had a little box uh, with the records and so on. She, she studied accounting. Uh, she was a, actually a, a PhD in econometrics, but she didn't know anything about accounting. And uh, so she took a night course in accounting. And uh, I, I put something on the door of her dressing room. There was a wonderful cartoon. It showed a medieval setting, a big castle with a tower, and someone was standing on the tower addressing the multitudes below. And one of the multitudes people said to the, his neighbor, and to think he started life as an accountant. So, <laughs> so she studied accounting, and, uh, and we, we built up the foundation. Initially, we gave money very broadly to social causes, to universities, uh, to a variety of things. But in uh, 2004, which is just 10 years ago, we decided to just focus on basic science and other kinds of giving that we did uh, were done outside of the foundation, and, and the foundation grew. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's a, a very, uh, it's, a, it's very good. It's a good foundation. Uh, we have a, a, a large project on uh, the causes of autism to try to understand that. It's really a lot of genetics and neuroscience. Uh, we have less uh, applied things in, in, in various aspects of life science. Uh, we have a math and physical science program, in fact, that David Eisenberg, who's sitting right there, uh, helped organize for us. Uh, uh, so we have various kinds of grants and programs and one thing or another. Uh, and we also started in the last few years goal-driven collaborative projects. So that's a, as it's stated, it's a collaborative project consisting of maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 scientists, typically in different places, but all working towards a common end. We have one on the or origins of life, which is an underfunded thing. Uh, you can't imagine the NSF's going to, certainly not the NIH is not going to give you any money for the origins of life. But it's really fascinating, and uh, that's a project. We have a project called Many Electrons, which is sort of a material science, uh, condensed matter physics, uh, trying to model the clouds of electrons inside materials. It's a many body problem, really. But you have, not only is it many bodies which are electrons that would normally repel each other, but you also have, they're entangled, if you guys know what entanglement means. It's a, a strange phenomenon in, in quantum mechanics. So modeling these big clouds of electrons is extremely difficult to do, even though the first principles are well known, but so what? And so uh, that, that's a project, and uh, that's going quite well, actually. We have a project in microbial oceanography, studying all the interactions between the myriad of uh, microbes in, in the oceans, and a, and a number of other things. So it's, uh, it, it's quite a vibrant uh, foundation, and I think maybe some people here have been beneficiaries. Anyone uh, gotten a grant from us? Yeah. Oh, oh, you're all in the first row. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't realize that. Okay, well, uh, I mean, I knew some people here got grants. So we give all kinds, oh, but someone way back there. Why aren't you in the first row with these beautiful girls? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's, uh, that's the foundation. Now, actually, under less than wonderful circumstances, I, I went back to uh, my older age uh, and, uh, to do mathematics again. And, and uh, in, 19, uh, in, in 2004, uh, we lost a son, we lost one of our sons. And that was obviously very sad. And kind of as a refuge, I just started thinking about math. And, you know, doing mathematics, you can retreat in, into your head, and you're just thinking about a problem, and it, and it can blot out other stuff. And, and uh, I thought about a problem in what's now called differential cohomology that I had thought about before, and, and I got serious about it, and um, it turned out I later discovered 
There was a group of Germans. Any Germans in the audience? Well, anyway. <laughs> okay, there are some Germans in the audience who were working on the same problem. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, but uh, I got an idea of how to solve it. It was, but it needed s some topology, which was beyond me. And I uh, spoke to my friend Dennis Solomon, who probably you've heard of, who's a great topologist. And together we, s we solved this problem. We beat out the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> They were very nice Germans, actually. They came uh, over and they, they had some other results that we didn't have and so on. And so uh, it was all very collegial, uh, but nonetheless, we beat them. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was gratifying. Uh, and since then, I've, I've, been, uh, I've written a couple of other papers with that. So I've, I'm back uh, in a small way uh, doing, doing some mathematics. So... I retired from, from Renaissance in, uh, uh, five years ago, uh, 2009, and, uh, well, I'm, I'm the chair, so I go to a monthly meeting, and, but uh, those guys are, are doing a wonderful job. Uh, Peter Brown and Bob Mercer, who uh, came out of IBM 20 years ago, and uh, they ran the speech recognition group for IBM. and. They came, and then they kept bringing members of their group to the Renaissance, and now they're, they're running the, the company. So, and I, I've just been uh, focusing on the foundation. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our, uh, I mentioned the other programs, the basic science program, but we have a program called Math for America in, in New York City, which uh, John Ewing, who was formerly the head of the executive director of the Math American Math Society, who was here, there he is, with his wife Janice, and uh, John runs that program, and it's a very successful, uh, very successful program of uh, getting competent teachers and, and rewarding them in the New York City schools and now in the, in the state schools as well, and uh, so uh, that's uh, th that's what I do. So. So I, I gave a similar talk some years ago, and my wife said, well, you know, you ought to talk, uh, uh, end the talk with your values, your values. And I said, I remember, I think we were in the car, and I said, but I'm not sure I have any, any values. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what my values are exactly. But uh, I said, well, but I, I, but I have some guiding principles, we'll call them guiding principles, which, which I, looking back, I think I probably followed. So I have five guiding principles, which I'll happily tell you. Um, so one of them is um, don't run with the pack. Try to, try to do something that's, that's original. Well, of course you want to do something original, but sometimes it's in, in math or in science in general, everyone's kind of running to solve the same problem, do the same thing. If you're really fast, maybe you're going to be the winner. But uh, it's better, uh, I think, uh, probably you're not going to be the winner. But if, if you can sort of do an end run around things, think about something that other people aren't thinking about, that's, that's a, a pretty good way to, to do things. Now, I've partnered with a lot of people, and I think that partnering with people is terrific, but you want to partner with wonderful people. And the, the names I've mentioned, uh, uh, Churn and Sullivan and, and uh, uh, various people, uh, John Ewing, uh, they've been really outstanding people, David Eisenbud, uh outstanding people. And uh, you can leverage your own efforts and uh, you know, sometimes get know, partner up with people who are smarter than you, but that's fine, and uh, it, it's, but just have good choice in partners, and I think that's, I've always tried to do that. A third principle is be guided by beauty. Now, you all are mathematicians, and you know the mathematics is beautiful, and um, you, you know, you, you know when an equation is great or, or an idea is, is very pretty and so on, and that's, that's a wonderful aesthetic to uh, follow. But it's not just true in mathematics. There's, there are uh, aesthetics in other enterprises. A, a well-run business is 
kind of a beautiful thing. If everything is just working just right and the, the, the pieces are meshing and it's a, a good organization, that, that's kind of beautiful. And, and it's, uh, so beauty is a, can be a good guide. Uh, the last, well, the penultimate uh, principle is don't give up. I mean, now, sometimes it is, discretion is the better part of valor, and you can just say to hell with it, but, uh, <laughs> and go on to something else, and, and that's a decision that we've all made at one time or another. But uh, persistence has a lot of value, and something that's really worthwhile can take a lot of time to come to fruition, and you ought to have patience uh, if you believe in something to, uh, to stick with it. And my final principle is uh, hope for good luck. <laughs> and that's it. So thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so the floor is open. Okay, who has a question? All right, there's one there. And speak loudly. So a lot of your stories were performed, you know, you did something kind of exciting that maybe didn't sound like the best idea at first, but you went ahead with it anyway and it turned out okay. Uh, so, I, so I would like to know um, if you have any wisdom to share about when not to do something. <laughs> when, when, when do you hold back? Well, I've not done a lot of things. <laughs> 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 so the question is, when do you, when uh, do I have any wisdom about when not to do something? And uh, well, I don't think I have any wisdom on that that anyone else. It looks like a room full of sensible people, and uh, you probably can, you know, uh, you've had a lot of opportunities to say no, and it's, and in particular, uh, being head of a foundation. You really need to know how to say no because, uh, you know, uh, if you, you, well, anyway, I was going to tell a joke, but I, <laughs> but I won't. Okay, another, another question. Yeah? I, I can't hear you. Okay, my thoughts on the hedge fund industry today. Do I think it's working right, or I think it's wor or, or, or what's right, or what's wrong? Well, there are a lot of hedge funds today. When when uh, when I started this, there were a lot fewer. Uh, a hedge fund, for those of you who don't know what they are, is uh, a fund that people invest in. Uh, the managers charge a percentage of the profits, uh, typically let's say 20 percent, and a fixed fee maybe one or two percent, and uh, they manage the money, and, uh, and you uh, hopefully uh, benefit from it. I, hedge funds have ebbed and, flow, uh, and, and, and ebbed and flowed. I don't know what the word is. They've, got, they've waxed and waned. They've got, <laughs> <laughs> they've got better and they've got worse. They go through periods where uh, they seem to be doing all very well. The last two years, hedge funds have not done very well, but uh, the markets have... Uh, one of the things that's good about some hedge funds buy and sell things and they go long and they go short, you need a certain amount of volatility to make that work. If nothing's really moving, then, then, it's, hard, then it's hard to make money. There's a lot of competition in hedge funds. There's an awful lot of them today. So I think probably uh, they, it, as a whole industry, it's not as successful as perhaps it was when there were fewer, but there are certainly some some good hedge funds, and they come in all stripes. We're, our fund, as, as I've told you, was 100% systematic, and there aren't very many of those, but there are some, and a few of them are good. Uh, but, uh, but there are many that have other uh, policies and uh, do fundamental trading, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a range uh, of, uh, of approaches. So that's all I can say about hedge funds, I think. Okay?
What's the reason? On these collaborative, goal-driven things, well, it's not our only focus. It's it, uh, the uh, it's 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 a uh, shaping up to be about a third of what we'll do, of what we're doing, and it's not there yet. Uh, I I find it uh, challenging and and enjoyable. Uh, it's uh, our autism project, which is certainly goal-driven and is it is collaborative, uh, has show me yeah this is a pretty good way to make progress and it, and I like I like working with people and I like seeing people working together so uh, it, it, you you have to be careful you understand that uh, the goal may be far off but if they're making progress like this origins of life I mean you know I don't think in my my lifetime I'm gonna know the answer, which is really what's a completely plausible path, let's say, to RNA or something like that, from first principles, how do we get to that? On the other hand, I see they're making some really nice nice progress and, and how this chemical came to in existence or that. And they're also looking at exoplanets and seeing, and, uh, and they can look at atmospheres of exoplanets and see what planets might have atmospheres that would be conducive to life. So a lot of science will get done. And gradually, we'll, we'll uh, you know, eventually maybe we'll, we'll find the answer. So I like that approach. It's not the only approach. Most of what the money we give out in mathematics is to individual researchers and so on, and all those people who held up their hands are individuals. But, uh, but I, I, I like that. Yes? When I was a kid, how did my parents help foster my mathematical knowledge? That's the question. And the answer is they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they thought I was a good kid. And they were uh, glad I liked school. But I don't think they said, this, this boy is going to be a mathematician or anything like that. So I, I wasn't put into any pushed in any direction whatsoever, except to do my homework. My mother, I was not a good homework doer. In fact, I hated doing my homework. Yes? In your professional life, when you look back, would you change anything? <laughs> like uh, going earlier into business or doing more mathematics? Okay, so would I change anything as I look back in my professional life? Well, not really. I don't think I, I made any huge mistakes. Uh, in my professional life, one doesn't know what a, a different path might have might have led to. But I, there's nothing that glares us on. Oh my God, I, I wish I hadn't done that. I mean, there's certainly things in my life that I can say I wish I hadn't said that, or or one thing or another, or gone out with that particular girl. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, in general, uh, no. When I look back. I think it was an okay path. There's nothing I would, no big change that I would want to make. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Okay, you, you next, but speak up. With the question of such smart people identify technology, and for all the years that you've been working there, um, I would think that on one end, you know, you guys try to make profit and there's a lot of people who are involved in the algorithm, but I would think that you probably Okay. Okay, that's a good question. The question is at Renaissance, where uh, the algorithms that they develop and the ideas are very proprietary, and not uh, you know you can't patent them or or, or copyright them because people will just take it over and, and you you just be in lawsuits all the time. Uh, the question is, if we're developing this kind of new science, would we have any wish to sort of share it with the general public uh, in some sense or other? And the answer is uh, no. <laughs> no, but that's not meant as a joke. The, the, uh, there isn't anything that these guys have done that, of such generality and power that it would be, that it's a shame that the world doesn't know it. It's, it's, it's a very powerful group of people 
who can focus on on data and and get some very uh, very good results. But it, but there's nothing but so general that it would uh, really need to be shared with the world, as far as I know. Yes. 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 Okay. The question is, what are my thoughts on math education uh, in America? And uh, my thoughts are, it needs to be better, as probably uh, most of you, most of you realize. So, so uh, kind of the background. I, I got interested in this because uh, when I went to Berkeley to be a graduate student, I was the uh, beneficiary of a National Defense Education Act fellowship. Now, only the old folks here have probably ever heard of the National Defense Education Act, but when Sputnik went up in 1957, uh, the, the whole country went in, into uh, spasm. And the Congress said, oh my God, you know, the Russians are going to beat us. Uh, they, they'll be on the moon throwing vodka at us uh, soon. Uh, we can't get our satellites up. They got theirs up. We need to strengthen the scientific enterprise in the United States. And they did. They created the National Defense Education Act. They beefed up the National Science Foundation. When I got my, was I quarrel with John about this, but I, I'm going to give the statistic anyway. When I got my PhD in 1961, I think there were fewer than 100 people in the United States, certainly 100 Americans, who got PhDs in mathematics. Ten years later, there were 1,400. Now, 100 was too few. 1,400, we didn't know what to do with them because, uh, the, you know, there weren't enough academic jobs. But, the f and, and in other uh, professions, other er scientific areas, this was similar. There was a lot of growth. And we saw a national problem, Cold War, and we were going to solve it through building up our science. And we did. We did a marvelous job of building up science. Um, salaries went up in, in, in uh, universities for uh, th those kind of folks, and a lot of people came in to science, young, young people, and it was a great success. So when, uh, about 15 years ago, I looked around, uh, more, maybe more uh, than 15 years, but, uh, and I realized that the teaching math, I was only focusing on math, in our schools was really not very good. And uh, and I realized, like we all do, that the economy is becoming far more quantitative than it, than it, than it used to be uh, 40 or 50 years ago. And more and more of, of things are based on quantitative methods. And we're not really keeping up. Our teachers, by and large, don't know, in particular in math, I think, the subject very well. Because if you know enough math to be a good high school teacher, and that means you know college math and something, so that you're not just one step ahead of the kids. If you know that much math and you have the least mental agility, which I, you'll see in a second, I don't have, uh, you know how to program a computer, uh, you can go to work for Google, you can go to work for Microsoft, you can go to work for Apple. I have an, an Apple fellow right here in front of me. Uh, and so, and you, you know, you're going to get paid twice as much and, uh, and so on. So what's to keep someone who actually knows the field in the profession? Well, you might really like teaching, and that's great. But the, the pull out, so something need to, needed to be done to make the job of teaching math, and in fact math and science, more attractive so that we would educate our kids better and be able to compete in the world. And... So I had I said, okay, I, I have a program. I know what to do. Uh, a friend of mine, or a guy who became my friend, Senator Schumer, Schumer, had just been elected. And part of the reason he was elected is because I gave him $250 or whatever it was. Anyway, I was a, su <laughs> I was a supporter of Senator Schumer. I probably was a little more. Uh, but I don't, it wasn't some huge amount, but I had a party for him and became a friend. And as soon as he got elected, I went right to Washington. I said, here's an idea. You've got to do this. And I said, create this program. 
reward people who give, give teachers a test. If they pass the test, you give them money, and uh, they'll, they'll uh, be rewarded, and they'll stay in the schools, and people will be drawn into the field because they're going to get an extra stipend from the government. You know, like the National Defense Education Act. They said, that's a great idea. I'll get right on it. And as I left his office, another group went in about, uh, I don't know, uh, something about uh, dams on the bre- uh, beaches of Long Island, and I heard him say, that's a great idea. I'll get right on it. <laughs> I'm exaggerating slightly, but only slightly. Uh, so uh, so not, uh, he didn't get right on it. We, ta- we had a few conversations about it, but nothing was going to happen as a federal program. And uh, so uh, a few years went by, and uh, then I, uh, actually MSRI was kind of in the picture because we had uh, a poker tournament to benefit at, at MSRI. David hooked me up with a few people in New York who were in the, also in the financial business. I don't know where you found those guys. And uh, we sat together. How can we benefit MSRI? And uh, uh, one of the guys was a poker player, and they were talking to him. And I said, hey, you know, I, and I like poker. I said, why don't we have a charity poker tournament? And we did. And it worked extremely well, and NMSRI got the benefit. But I thought, well, if it, we're going to do this every year in New York, it better be something that really relates more to New York, because I'm not going to get these guys coming out every year to give money to MSRI, which is in California, and and for math research. I don't know how we talked him into it the first time, but. Uh, <laughs> so then I thought, okay, you know, maybe this is the time to start this program here in the city and just do it ourselves. And so, uh, so we did. And, uh, and we had the tournament every year and that raised some money. And of course I provided a great deal of it uh, on top of that. And uh, so that the program was started privately. Uh, Two years ago, the state of New York uh, took on to do the same program outside the city as we're doing in the city, and they're building up. We have 800 teachers of now math and science in New York City. Uh, next year, it'll be 1,000, and that will be 10% of the math and science teachers in New York will be part of this core of really knowledgeable, committed teachers, they all get extra stipends and so on, and the state's doing the same thing. And we're hoping that other states in the country uh, will take on. The federal government is uh, in a state of paralysis, and uh, it's probably better to work through states. But it's a long haul. That's a very long answer. I'm sorry. Uh, And maybe I'll take one more question. Okay. Uh, Bur- uh, you mean Burba? Burba Key, yeah, yeah, Burba Key. Do you guys know about Burba Key? You know about Burba Key? Well, it was a sort of a, uh, the French, of course, did this. Any French people in the audience? No. <laughs> uh, you know, they wanted to codify, you know, uh, all of, you know, in the United States and England, we have common law. The tradition and the traditions grow up, and they, you know you, you go by various court cases, and that becomes the law, and one thing or another. In France, and it's not like that at all. They, everything is codified. The they whole, you know, Napoleon wrote this code, and you know the French like to codify everything. And so, uh, the Bourbaki wanted to get right down to it and codify mathematics in some way or other. I think some of it was pretty good. I'm not an expert on it. Uh, what, you, what do you think about poor Barkey? <laughs> well, you mentioned the National Science Foundation. It was created in 1958, by the way, by Congress. Oh, that's when it was. They created it. I see. It was actually created at that time. But, uh, well, okay. Uh, at that time, I mean, they did many good things, but they, you also had the School Mathematics Study Group. If you're going to a group of 40 individuals. Twenty of them were math professors from leading universities. The other twenty were headmasters from 
meaning prep school. And they appear to have been heavily influenced by Bourbaki. In fact, they wrote a booklet which contained the following statement, which I saw 50 years ago. They said, in the 1990s, every math student in elementary school will be exposed to topology. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, <laughs> will he catch it? Will they catch it or just be exposed to it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's no, no question, and I'm sure the federal money is not well spent, and my Republican friends think not a penny of it is well spent, but, uh, but I think some of it is. Anyway, I, I think we have to stop. David is going to throw me off. Well, I have indeed. Thank you.